I now call on the public orator to present the honorary graduate Ruth Lee CBE for admission to her degree. Pro-Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress, Mayor and Mayoress, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Lee CBE, the recipient of the university's highest honour, that of Doctor of Business Administration, Honoris Causa, for her outstanding contribution to economics in the UK and internationally. Ruth is a highly respected, at times maverick, voice of the political centre-right. During her long career, her economic analyses, commentaries and perceptions have often been heeded, just occasionally reviled, but never ignored. She has proved herself a critical friend to the government, but never its poodle. Her hallmark is a doggedness of integrity, independence and indefatigability and at times her candour has cost her dear. Ruth was raised on the family farm in Warburton, Cheshire, just after the war, and attended nearby Lim Grammar, later Lim High School. Their alumni sit among us today. At Lim, she was a contemporary of cult Hollywood actor Tim Curry. Ruth has always been very musical. Right from my earliest days, she said, I was brought up with music. Her father, Tom, who is now 94 and cannot be here today, unfortunately, would play the organ at the church in Warburton where Ruth sang as a girl. Alas, any showbiz collaboration between her and Tim Curry is as yet unknown to historians. Now, Lim, Lim is a suburb of Warrington where we have a campus. It was and remains an area renowned globally for the tough old worlds of wire stretching and rugby league. Indeed, sometimes the two activities are indistinguishable. The Warrington Wolves play with our name on their shirts and steely determination is not an untypical characteristic. You may have guessed already where I might be going with this. After graduating in economics and statistics from both York and Bristol universities, this grammar school and crucially non-Oxbridge educated young woman, a rarity in Whitehall in those days, went on to pursue very successful careers in government, industry and academia. But, as we shall see, her path has been far from straightforward and not without its frustrations. She emerged into the workplace during Harold Wilson's white heat of change, an era of industrial and ideological confrontation. This context proved highly formative for Ruth. And for 16 long years, Ruth worked for the government in the Treasury, the Civil Service College, the Central Statistical Office, and the Department of Trade and Industry. She was told her job was to manage the decline, not arrest or reverse, to manage. A year lecturing at Thames Polytechnic, she said later, was when I learned how to speak to an audience. Now, things were going to plan until she went before the promotions board, where her meteoric ascent was suddenly blocked by that unacknowledged barrier to progression, the glass ceiling. There may be many of us here today who may know that feeling well. 
Your high-flying career, my dear, she said to herself, has just lost its wings. Now, I alluded earlier to Ruth's determined character, so you won't be surprised at her response. My reaction, she said, was, my God, I will show you. Boy, I will show you. And boy, she did indeed show them. So in 1988, during the last few turbulent years of Margaret Thatcher's premiership, Ruth made the bold decision to change careers and move to Mitsubishi Bank as chief economist, then Learman Brothers as chief UK economist, and a move, she said, which I have never regretted. If you feel you're undervalued, she said later, there's only one person who can really do anything about it, and that is you. It could have rebounded on me, she adds, but this exposure to the Japanese culture of corporate dynamism was a wonderful experience for which I shall always be grateful. She has served on several key public advisory bodies, including the Retail Price Index Advisory Committee, the National Consumer Council, the Roundtree Foundation Income and Wealth Inquiry Group, the Nurses Pay Review Body, and numerous institutions concerned with research and statistics. She has also authored many academic and journalistic articles. Frequently appearing on Question Time, Any Questions and the Today programme, her wealth of knowledge is allied to a journalist's ear for clarity, straightforwardness and wit. Indeed, as economics editor for ITN, in 1994 she gained recognition for demystifying public understanding of the economy in the wake of so-called Black Wednesday, when the John Major government was forced to withdraw Britain from the exchange rate mechanism, the forerunner to the Euro. It was the era that ushered in new labour, and it galvanised her view of Europe considerably. It was, she said, a real wake-up call about Europe. In 1995, Ruth joined the highly influential Institute of Directors as head of policy unit. It was here that she would once again speak her version of the truth unto power. After a now infamously heated engagement with Gordon Brown over budget representations, she she emerged, shall we say, unconvinced by the new Labour charm offensive. But not so her more ambitious colleagues. She was made redundant. They received a knighthood and an OBE, respectively. Undaunted, Ruth became director of the Centre of Policy Studies, the think tank set up by Margaret Thatcher and Sir Keith Joseph to promote ideas around freedom and responsibility allied to free market economics. In 2007, with Lord Norman Blackwell, she co-founded Global Vision, a cross-party Eurosceptic campaign group. And since 2005, she has worked for the Orbuthnot Banking Group, firstly as non-executive director, and since 2007, its chief economic advisor. Currently, she is also chairman of Economists for Britain, whose members believe that the UK should seek substantial change in its relationship with the EU. Vice Chancellor, in her 69th year, and at a time when Britain's place in the world faces generational challenges, Ruth Lee's appetite for the cut and thrust of public debate remains absolutely undiminished. In academia, she has been governor of the London School of Economics and a council member of the University of London. She has received many honours, including liverymanship of the Worshipful Company of Couriers and the Worshipful Company of World Traders, and has freedom of the City of London itself. She has received many honorary doctorates from the BPP and the University of Greenwich, along with memberships and fellowships of professional societies. This year, Her Majesty the Queen appointed her Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the New Year's Honours List. And those who've met Ruth know her to be warm, funny and compassionate woman and an excellent mimic, 
I can tell you her take on Tony Benn is pretty spot on. And her beloved nieces, Rose and Carol, who are supporting her here today, will attest to these fine qualities. Her other interests include heritage and the attempted herding of cats, for whom she maintains a large Edwardian house in Finchley. Vice-Chancellor, as economists might say, talk is cheap because supply always exceeds demand. But before I finish, there is one important side to Ruth Lee that we have only touched on. Her deep love of music, particularly singing, which she even considered pursuing as a career, but determined it would be her great hobby instead. An aficionado of the Romantics, she once said of her beloved Tchaikovsky, it is the great expansiveness of emotion which I find so utterly appealing. I feel he's just wonderful. So there we are. To her, as to many of us, it may be economics that makes it possible to live, but it's music that makes life worth living. Or perhaps, as local maestro Sir Thomas Beecham put it, the function of music, he said, is to release us from the tyranny of conscious thought. Vice-Chancellor, in the name of the Senate and of the Council, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Ruth Lee for admission to the degree of Doctor of Business Administration honoris causa in this university. I thought your voice was very fine in the film, so now I know you are. By virtue of the authority invested in me, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Business Administration honoris causa in this university. Congratulations. It gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Ruth Lee to address the congregation. I thought I'd wait until the organ music stopped before speaking. But uh, joking apart, Provost Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress, Mayor and Mayoress, distinguished guests, lady and gentlemen, I am absolutely delighted to be here today. And I thank you, Ian, for your kind words. I was both honored and delighted to be approached about this degree. It is a great honour to be uh, awarded and presented with a Doctorate of Business Administration from Chester University in this wonderful building of Chester Cathedral, which I remember from my childhood. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, for conferring it upon me. It is all more special to me because, of course, I am Cheshire-born and bred. And I was at a very smart dinner in the City of London last week, such is the bane of my life, and somebody said to me, a fellow diner said to me, quite out of the blue, do you regard yourself as a Londoner? 
because after all, you've lived more than two thirds of your life in the capital city. Not for a moment's hesitation, but I hasten to add it was only a moment's hesitation. I said, no, I don't. I said, I still felt that my roots were in Cheshire because I suppose that was where I was brought up. She thought my answer very strange, but we agreed to disagree, although one thing we did agree about, that the city of London and London in general is the greatest city on the planet. Uh, the Chester is the second greatest city on the planet. Um, but it's a slightly different size from London. And may I add my congratulations to Chester University for its terrific progress since acquiring full university status in 2005. Although, of course, I'm aware that its history goes back to 1839 when the Diocesan Training College was established. It always struck me that a, this historic and wonderful city of Chester should have its very own university. And of course, now it does have. And I was especially interested in the fact, it's amazing what you can find on Wikipedia, you know, that the university has got one of, is one of the best performing, if not the best performing universities in the northwest of England with regards to employability. And whilst I recognize that higher education study and university experience are good things in themselves, I must admit a job is a big bonus. And I congratulate all the graduates here today and wish them every good wish for their future careers. I count myself very fortunate. As uh, Ian said, I read economics and statistics, and they have seen me through, and are still seeing me through, a most fascinating and varied career. I suspect that few people have had a career as varied as mine, running through from the civil service, higher education, City of London, Mitsubishi Bank, Lehman Brothers, which actually went bust in 2008, ITN, Institute of Directors, Mrs. Thatcher's Think Tank, etc., etc., etc. And I remember the one bit of advice I got when I started to work at ITN, because after I'd never been a journalist before that, I'd been an economist in the city, he said, whatever you do, never dry up. If you are on camera, just keep talking. It doesn't matter what you say, most people won't notice. So I talked gibberish for the next two or three years. However, and I think economics and statistics are still bearing me in very good stead in what I regard as the great political issue of our time. And following on from Ian's remarks, you'll not be surprised to hear that relates to the referendum on our membership of the European Union. I remember very well in the 1970s when we joined, and as Ian pointed out, when I was a young civil servant, and I was a young civil servant, then all we were told about was that we were there in the civil service to manage decline. I thought that was an extraordinarily pessimistic, pessimistic thing to say to anybody who just started their career. Indeed, the country had lost an empire and not yet found a role, as one US Secretary of State uh, announced. And of course, at the time, back in the 70s, 40 years ago, the uh, EEC, as it was called then, was, was doing much better economically than Britain. We were affectionately known as a sick man of Europe, whereas Germany, Italy, France, the Benelux countries were powering away. They looked dynamic and we looked sick. And somehow, they, I remember it very well, people said, if we join the EEC, then some of their dynamism will rub off on us. Suffice to say, the situation then got worse, and we had to be bailed out by the IMF in the late 1970s. But that's 40 years ago, and uh, much has changed since then. I mean, I'm delighted to say, I think, that Britain has recovered its pep although I concede there have been a few bumps on the road, not least of all the recent financial crisis. Meanwhile, Europe is undeniably in relative decline and seems to be struggling to cope with its current twin crises of the Eurozone and the refugee crisis. I know how I'm going to vote in the referendum. Um, I don't know if I'm going to allow you to guess, but I'll put you out of your misery and say that I'm going to vote to leave. The EU was the future once. I really did believe that in the 1970s, but it ain't the future now. And I actually believe it acts as a costly restraint and the future of this country is in the wider world. 
But far be it from me to turn this into a political speech, and I know full well that all the independently minded people in this cathedral today, and that's all of you by the way, because I've no doubt you are all independently minded, will make your own mind up when it gets to the referendum. And on that note, I'll just say once again, thank you, thank you, Chester University. Thank you, everybody here. I really do feel honoured and privileged to be given this honour today. Thank you.